The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, my name's Andrew Rocks, and welcome to the Engine Room Podcast, a podcast where we lift the lid on practices to find out how they work, why they work, why people join them, why people stay, and what makes them successful. I'm really happy today to have Corey on from First Wealth, and I'm going to start with a dad joke, as we we, 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 we sort of predicted at the beginning. So for an organisation called Ensemble, you can be the verse and I'll be the chorus. How does that That's work, mate? No? Terrible start, yeah. isn't it? No, no, that, that works, mate. I know you've got three boys and I've got two boys with a third child coming and I'm all over the dad jokes. So, um, yeah, I think that's the right place to start. So, thank you. Great. Well, we can we can simulate the, the, the set eye roll at the dinner table every so often. But um, I suppose um, we've had a good chat beforehand and I'm really, really looking forward to this. You've got a great dynamic business in, in Verse Wealth. And um, I suppose I'd like to kick off with just a little bit about yourself, um, how you've come to be in the position you're in, and what made you sort of start this business, and more importantly, I suppose, the, the, the real purpose of it. Yeah, sure. So I'll, t- I'll take you back to the start, uh, Roxy. So got into advice in 2011, I started at CBA, um, which was, I guess, in hindsight, the tail end of a well-documented bad period uh, for them. And you know, I kind of went into financial advice um, thinking it would be one thing, but then when I started, I realized at least where I was, it was something very different to that. You know, I thought the role of the advisor, you know, was well when you sit down with, you know, perhaps husband and wife, have these great conversations about who are you, what do you value, what's important to you, what are you trying to achieve, what goals have you got, what stresses have you got that are driven wholly or partially by money. And then when you know those things, then you'd work with people to help them build plans, make choices, put strategies in place, have investments, um, products if they need it, and so on. And and that'd be, I guess, the the nature of the relationship and the role. And and when I started at CBA, it was really more so sales masquerading as professional advice. At, at that point, it was a real contradiction for me. Um, I, I had a great experience there and I learned a lot of things and I think I sharpened my focus as to what kind of advisor I want to be and what kind of advisor I, I don't want to be. And I think in those you know, three and a half years I was there, I think I spent the majority of the time with the intention to leave and start my own firm. And, um, you know, my motivation in doing that wasn't to you know, be self-employed or have all this, you know, freedom that, they, that so-called business owners have. It wasn't to build my own client book. It really was to, to change what it meant to be an advice and what it meant to get advice. And can I ask you, did you, did you, did you just think that you were going to go out there and start a little business or, 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 you know, what are you five, how many years on are we now? Quite a few years. Yeah, we and, started in 2015. So we're right. eight years in now. And um, it's, you've got a significant business. So was that what you thought of from the outset or what was your mindset when you, um, uh, as far as the, the, the company mindset um, that, that complemented the way in which you, you wanted to deal with clients? Yeah, well- I always wanted to build an enterprise. I wanted to 
build a brand. And as I said, I wanted to help shift what it meant to be an advisor and what it meant to get advice. And I know that sounds lofty as I say it. And to some people, it's going to sound grand- grandiose. But I guess for me personally, they were they were the main motivators of that and probably a fair bit of ego as well, I'd say, looking back and um, being a little more self-aware now perhaps. Um, but yeah, I wanted to, wanted to build a national business that had not just myself, but, but many advisors giving advice in a way that we all really felt proud of and, you know, had more people seeking advice resultantly. So, so a real Jerry Maguire who's with me kind of moment. Is that right? Well, no one, well, I say no one left, I say no one left with me. I did have someone leave with me. I had a co-founder at the time, James O'Reilly, who, you know, that, that partnership, uh, lasted three years and James has gone on to, to build another, another business, which is doing its own good things. Um, but, um, you know, we didn't go buy a, a client base. We didn't want to inherit any of the traditions of financial advice. And that was something we were saying at the time. Um, we wanted to start with what we were calling it was a blank canvas approach and really start with the end in mind. Like if this is the role of the advisor, as we see it, like what would the advisor do and how would we build a business around that? And it's taken like a really long time with a lot of work and effort and mistakes and so on to get where we are now. And I guess where we are now is, um, you know, it's, um, an evolved representation of like what we had in mind when we, when we first started. And, um, in relation to the type of clients and, and, um, uh, advisors that, that, that you desire to have in your business, what's, 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 what's the offering at verse? Maybe just give us a bit of a high level of what, what it is that you offer. Yeah. So, well, first thing in terms of who we offer it to. So our clients tend to fall into one of two camps. Um, they're either high income professional families, typically 35 to 55. So, you know, ambitious, time poor, good free cash flows. Not Until sure they what, pay what, school fees. Corey. Yeah, true, yeah. true. They might tighten it up a bit. But, you know, they, I guess they're, you know, they're not sure on what the right strategy is for them. They want to make sure their money's really working for them. They've got, you know, they're in a dyna- really dynamic phase of, of life with a lot of competing priorities um, and resources are limited, time, energy, and money. So that's one camp. The other camp is more the traditional financial advice client, the pre-retiree. You know, they're kind of, you know, early 50s to 67. One of the main motivations for reaching out is, hey, you know, I need a retirement plan. Or I'm thinking about retirement. I want to make sure I'm doing the right things now to, to, to make, that, make that a reality. So that the pre-retiree would be probably 35% of the new clients we're on board. And um, that high income professional, um, which is probably top 5% household income, um, would be, you know, kind of two thirds of the clients we're onboarding at this point. Yeah, that's what we're doing it for. I know you asked me a couple of questions there. So um, in, ter- in terms of, I guess, um, uh, the approach. So, you know, we've, we've built the whole client experience around three pillars and they are values, intentions, and financial well-being. So values being the things that are really important to you. That could be family, freedom, health and well-being, balance, community, security. Um, intentions being the things you intend to do or achieve. So a lot of advisors will call these goals. Um, so we want to travel. We want to uh, upgrade the house. We want to have more kids. We want to start a business, sell a business, retire, work less, all those things. And they're the things that we'll strategize around, we'll plan around, we'll model out. The values are just a reference point for when they need to be for really important decisions a client might make. So example might, example might be, um, you know, client values, health and well-being, family, freedom. They're a 45-year-old executive making really good money, saving plenty of money, making really good progress financially. But those things that are important in their life, they rate them out of 10, how well they're happening. It's a digital exercise. And they might rate them as like a 4, 3, and 4 out of 10. And it becomes really obvious to them that even though they're making good progress financially, it's not leading to contentment and satisfaction. So they're not making the right choices. And if they're not making the right choices, we're probably not giving the right advice. So that's why we just have the values as a reference point where they need to be uh, uh, along the way. And, and you may or may not know this, but this morning I went on to your, your website and I did my own financial well-being score, which was a very useful exercise, even for someone who's been in financial advice for, for a while. Would you like to know how I scored, Corey? Well, I actually saw it, Roxy. I was actually... um on the tram on the way in at lunchtime eating some sushi and I saw that come in and I thought, Matt, he's, Roxy looks like he's doing okay. I don't think he needs any advice. No, hardly. No, no. The, the things that um, uh, all, all planners and dreamers are good at is, is, is um, I've sorted out all my long-term goals, but I have to admit the short-term cash flow communications with your partner never goes away. So I thought, I th- I'm glad that you did see it. I'm glad that it makes it all the way up there. But um, yeah, and, and it, it's a really good tool as well. And um, uh, gives a bit of self-awareness. 
Yeah, thanks. For, thanks for saying, uh, Roxanne. Yeah, in terms of that, the financial well-being being one of those three pillars I was referring to. So you know, we we think you can you can have a plan and you can have an advisor and you can have a strategy, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to feel as confident and as in control of your financial life as you want to. So we track and measure how everyone feels about their financial life. And if that's a couple, that's individually within that couple, because they're going to feel different about different things. So they complete a quiz, typically on their smartphone, takes on average just under four minutes. It's 27 questions, six areas of their financial life, gives them a score out of 100. And it gives the advisor this really nuanced insight into how someone feels about different aspects of their money. So you can start to dive into what those aspects are, where they're coming from, and you can then you're well-placed as the advisor to actually not just be a strategist, but a great coach. And you can have the right conversations with the client and lead them to a greater sense of control and and, 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 and empowerment. And ultimately, I think more than anything, that's what clients really want. They, want. they just want to feel good. They don't want to feel stressed. They want to feel in control and confident. Well, th- thanks a lot. And look, I think the um, the whole premise of, of this particular series is the building of the business of the business. And from what you've said just then, that you actually started – uh, this business with an enterprise, building an enterprise in mind. It's actually quite unusual. The, the, the well-worn sort of uh, path for financial services and financial planning businesses is, is the, the person who's really good with the clients who, who starts off. They then realize that, 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 that practice management, general management is something else, but it's quite unusual for someone who straddles both and enjoys straddling both. So I'm just going to sort of change up the gears uh, here and um, maybe just get a bit of a for everyone listening. Um, you've mentioned how you treat your clients, but let's lift the lid and find out how you actually, you know, how you can how you can actually deliver for your business. So maybe just give us a bit of an idea of the organisational structure in, in in your business, um, and just how that marries up with with the way in which you want to deliver to your clients. Sure. Well, I think the first thing to note is that we've got our own AFSL and we're in, independent. Um, both those things being in, important to us, the AFSL for the autonomy and the independence, I guess, just being uh, an in-part representation of how we think advice is best done when those conflicts are, are removed. In terms of the organisational... S- sorry, before you go on, Corey, just, just in relation to the AFSL, I love asking this. D- do you um, do you have an external person who helps manage that, that, that business um, uh, or, or do you run it yourself? Yeah, so I mean, we've got our head, head of operations slash head of compliance within the team, Daniel, um, who's brilliant, by the way. Um, Shout out, Daniel. Uh, yeah, externally we've got um, we've got Gail from RMGC based in Perth as our compliance consultant, um, who I know also works with some other or with some great businesses. And um, yeah, if anyone's looking for a great compliance consultant and you're thinking about getting your own AFSL, I'd absolutely recommend talking to Gail. Awesome, awesome. Thank you very much. I always like to ask those questions because. Um, uh, it's if, if if your AFSL is not structured properly and your governance not structured properly, it's very difficult to be able to deliver. How all said. So so in terms of the um, organisational structure, Roxy, um, and the team's evolved a lot in recent times. We were a team of five about two and a half years ago. We're a team of eighteen at present. Um, we've got myself that's you know, evolving into the, the chief executive role. Um, we've got Daniel Donovan, who's our wonderful head of operation. Um, and we've got at this point we've got uh, six advisors uh, on the team. Um, four of those have started in the last uh, nine months. Um, we've got another one hopefully coming on board uh, next month as well. Um, we've got three associates uh, in the team supporting those uh, six advisors. Um, we are a little bit associate heavy at the moment. We think we can probably run on a ratio of three advisors to one associate based on the like the current roles and responsibilities. Um, and we've also got seven teammates uh, in the Philippines. So we've been, um, we've had Philippines teammates now for almost, almost from the get-go, mate. You know, going back about five or six years ago, um, we started, um, and I don't like the term outsourcing, we've got Philippines teammates and they're really integrated into our team, um, into our culture. Um, they're high performers with high standards like, like the rest of the team and uh, they do our power planning, um, they do our implementation and they help a lot with um, the onboarding. We get a lot of leads. We'll probably touch on that, um, as well as the um, the management of what we call the journey service, which is in tradition, in, in normal speak, ongoing service. And um, yeah, that's the the makeup of the team at, at this point. And and do you, do you, you mentioned that you've got six uh, six ARs, but quite a few have come on recently. 
and you've just threatened on on uh, on an open carriage that you're about to uh, make the AAs do more work because you're gonna, you're going to mix that ratio up. Do do any of your current associates is that a sort of a path that they move into advice through a PY? Is that something that um, you envisage? Yeah, definitely. So the most recent associate we hired, uh, Tiana Rhodes, who started uh, last month, has just finished her PY and just before. She came on board. She's got the intention to be an advisor, not too far down the track. We've got the same intention for her. One of our associates has just been promoted to advisor. Um, so he'll go through it. I guess a transition where he's in kind of like a hybrid role over probably 12 months um, before being a fully fledged advisor in terms of his time. And we've got another associate named Stu, um, who uh, Stu's been with us just over two years. We all love him to death. And, uh, he had uh, his first role in advice with the intention to be an advisor himself. He'll start his key wine on one July um, with a view to, to once that start him, you know, hopefully soon after, you know, beginning to, to move into the advisor role as well. So it's absolutely a pathway, but it's one we're kind of building over time as well. I've got two questions to ask. And um, uh, the first one is, um, um, yeah, yeah, well put. The, the people who are working for you aren't, who aren't necessarily working out of your office or might be working from a different country. That is part of your global team. And and a, and a quick look on your website, um, it looks like you've got a one team, one dream philosophy there as far as having them having them there and having making people, if you want to create a culture, which we'll touch on later, um, then it has to be uh, all in, one in, all in. It can't be a two-tiered one. So congratulations on that. And then my burning question is, um, with all of the internal promotion, with, with bringing on new advisors, where, where the hell are you getting your clients from? Yeah, so we've got, at, at this point, I think a really effective digital marketing strategy. So, like I mentioned to you when we were chatting recently, you know, we're getting. Oh, this is only going to be between you and I, mate. Don't worry about it. Just tell tell tell, <laughs> tell me how you do it. No one else is going to figure it out. Yeah. So, well, I'm not, I'm not apprehensive about that. But um, you know, at this point, we're getting around 130 to 160 leads and referrals a month. A lot of wow. those, the lion's share of those, come online. And it's through a combination of sources. You know, we do a lot of advertising across uh, Google, other search engines, social media, and so on. And that doesn't get your lead. It gets you traffic to your website. So then you've got to be able to convert traffic to inquiry at a good rate to make an effective strategy. Um, we've been doing this now using a digital marketing agency for about two and a half years. So we've been doing that with increasing effectiveness over time in terms of cost per lead, quality of lead, and so on. Um, and as we've done that, we've scaled up our our ad spend, um, and but we also get a lot of we get a, a lot of organic traffic to the site as well. So like I remember when we f- first started, and in the first few years, like you'd Google Burst Wealth, and you'd you'd read to the first page, and there of course you click the page two, and you keep going. And I remember like being on page thirteen at one point, thinking, "Geez, I wonder what it'd be like to like get to get to page one," because um, if you're not on the page one. You kind of not 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 right, really. So yeah, the good but, news is no one would know you're on page thirteen other than you, because no one would have got that far. There's no doubt. So so don't don't stress. Um, and with I was about to ask, you, do you do that in house? But you don't. You have an external company who who you, you pay for, and and they achieve monthly goals for you. Is that right? Yeah. So well, that, that's in part right. So yeah, we yeah. have a digital marketing agency that we've been working with really closely for for two and a half years. And they run, they run the ad campaigns and they build ads in collaboration with us in terms of the narrative and the copy, i.e. the words and imagery and so on. But but like running an, running a digital ad strategy by itself is, is not going to be a winning strategy. You have all of these things that need to underpin the ad strategy. So th- things like, you know, you've got to have a really clear, differentiated, you know, value proposition. Because when someone goes to Google, they're not typing in verse wealth, they're typing in financial advice, Melbourne, or retirement planning, Sydney, and they're going to find heaps of results. So they're probably going to look at multiple websites and they're trying to identify as a consumer, like who resonates with me the most? Based on my instincts, where do I think is the best place to go and get go and get advice? So to help them do that and for that to, to be ours, A, you've got to have a compelling message that, that, that speaks to them. You've got to have some social proof. So things like you know, online reviews, Google reviews are, are the most powerful. So we've got 140 plus five-star Google reviews now. And it's just not the numbers that matter. It's the commentary where people talk about the experience they've had and the impact that it's had, had on them. Um, you know, you know, we've started winning you know, multiple awards and so on, fortunately, in the last few years. And all of these things create great kind of credibility. They create authority. They create confidence for people that they're in the right place. And um, you know, if you can get them to your site and then get them to move their way through your site and ultimately book a chat in, 
um, you know, all of those things working together actually creates a creates a winning digital strategy. But, but none of that happens overnight. You know, no, that, getting no, those course. Google reviews, having the social proof, you know, uh, uh, writing articles that get published for the greater good um, uh, is, 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 is a lot of foundation work. And, and I imagine you've been doing that since you started um, and you're now reaping uh, the rewards there. Would that be correct? Yeah, definitely. I, and I say that to people when they say, hey, like you guys are getting so many leads, like how are you doing that? I kind of feel like I need to explain, well, it's, it's in part a reflection of all the things we we're doing five, six years ago, like busting our gut, trying to give people the best possible advice we could, the best client experience we could, you know, and you'd start to get these Google reviews. And because of that, you might start to be asked to contribute to different publications and things like that. So it's kind of like this big melting pot. And I think you just kind of keep putting good quality ingredients in this melting pot and just kind of keep stirring it. Um, and, you know, o o over time, you know, you, 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 you create something that, um, that works or tastes good, I guess. Does that analogy work? Well, yeah, absolutely. When I'm looking at, at, at this engine room, part of um, driving a business is also knowing what you, you're not good at. So can I, I maybe just ask, um, do you do every aspect of, of the financial planning journey or do you have joint ventures or partnerships? Maybe just to get a bit of clarity because you did mention earlier that 35 to 55 executive couples is your zone. Those people consume a lot of stuff. Um, what, what is it that, that, that you have um, sort of driven for execution in your business? Yeah, well, we, I mean, we do all the financial planning advice, um, but there's a lot of referral partners we have that we refer to really regularly and that we collaborate with. Like the for an accumulator client coming on board in the first 12 months, on average, there's about three referrals to other other professionals. So they're across accounting, they're across property, um, they're across estate planning, they're across personal insurance, which I know is something that a lot of advisors or firms do in house. From our perspective, you know, we don't we don't think that personal insurance is financial planning. Um, you know, people need insurance, just like they need a will as part of being financially organized and responsible, but we don't view it as a responsibility of the advisor. The advisor's job is to help the client set goals, set intentions, put strategies in place, make those choices and so on. So we've got some great partners around insurance that we refer to. Um, the one service we've recently bought in-house is mortgage broking. It's so, so closely correlated to the, the plans and the strategies of a lot of our clients. So as of September, we bought uh, Tim. Um, into the team, and um, you know, and that's been, I think, uh, an improvement to the client experience by streamlining it and just creating more collaboration between the advisors and, you know, in this case, our mortgage broker. And do you find that from the, the clients really expect that because they don't know what they don't know? Quite often, you would be the first planning experience for a thirty-five-year-old potentially. Uh, do you feel that sometimes they just expect that you would look at their debt? Uh, I, th I think to a degree. I mean, I, I think that, like you said, they don't they don't know what they don't know. And they're coming to us saying, hey, here's the resources I've got and here's what's important to us and what we want to achieve. Let's work backwards from there. That's how we think about it anyway. And I'm pretty sure that's how most consumers think about it. So then our role is to go, okay, well, in helping you achieve that, here's what we can do, but here's what you need done by others. So we're going to link you up with those others and we'll collaborate with them to make sure we execute on the execute on the plan. Oh, well, shout out to Tim, mate. Um, the... Uh, it, it's going to be it's going to be a fun time joining a, a dynamic team that's uh, growing so so quickly. Um, I just might change gears for the moment, and I'd love to hear um, what's what's the tech stack that Verse Wealth um, uses. And I've I've heard whispers that you've experimented with video SOAs. So maybe kick off with the tech stack and and sort of um, how close to that unicorn moment of of uh, video and user friendly SOAs have you got? Yeah, so with the tech stack, and the tech stack's pretty pretty broad. Salesforce is at the centerpiece of our, our CRM, um, and we produce the advice documents via Salesforce, via Conga. We use Zoom for, for virtual meetings. With the IFSL, we take a lot of payments ourselves, so direct debit payments from bank accounts and trusts and so on are done by Stripe. Um, Calendly is used for all online bookings. Typeform is a very integral um, part of our client experience. So that's what does online. Typeform do? You're quite passionate. What do they do? Yeah, no, well, it's online. It's online. It's, it's simple, sexy, um, elegant online surveys, Roxy. So we'll use it for things like um, investment preferences, i.e., you know, a version of risk profiling, um, pre meeting questionnaires, uh, a financial life snapshot that someone that's booked in an introductory chat by our website will complete before that introductory chat um, and we use it internally for things like questionnaires before teammates slash performance reviews so um, we use voyant for modeling which came out from the uk 
um, only about 15, 18 months ago. And you were part of the beta testing phase. It is the best, simple, easy to use, dynamic modeling software that I and our advisors have seen by a mile. And, and I haven't seen good modeling elsewhere. So um, maybe it exists, but if you're looking for a better modeling solution, we'll absolutely get in touch with the team in Voyant. That's V-O-Y-A-N-T. Um, digital client agreement is all done via Quilla. Um, so they're all templated. They take about 60 seconds to do. And then you've got the ancillary stuff, you know, things like MailChimp for email marketing, you know, Zero Trello for Kanban boards. And, um, yeah, and we use Score App for the, um, for the financial wellbeing quiz to track and measure how people are feeling about their finances. So there's a bit there, um, but they're, you know, they're, I guess they're the, the main things well, that we're you using. Sound, at you this sound point. very passionate. And um, a shout out to Voyant. It sounds like the only sort of individual with a better model strategy is uh, Leonardo DiCaprio as we speak. So um, <laughs> um, I'm not sure it's the same same vibe, but... Um, yeah, that's um, debatable and subjective. I'm sure not all of our listeners will, will think that he's, um, he's doing well with his modeling strategy, but yeah. Uh, I thought I'd change gears. And what about um, uh, video SOAs? You know, this is the... I see a fair bit of this on LinkedIn. People are talking about it. Yeah. Um, I've never seen it in practice as a client or as an advisor. So maybe just give us an idea of how that operates. Yeah. So, I mean, we've, people use the term video SOAs and we've got what we'd call our own version of video SOAs because our SOA isn't, isn't just a video. So um, bit of background, FPA has been promoting and educating advisors around the concept of video SOAs for a little bit of time. Now it's been headed up by Ben Marsh and, and Fraser Jack, both passionate advocates and leaders in advice. And, and I am all about advisors and practices and firms or whatever you call yourself, educating yourself around what are the legal requirements of an SOA and how can that be delivered? Um, and then going through either one of the FPA workshops or, you know, if you're a member, jumping onto the portal, typing in SOAB, um, standing for SOA production and look through the 15 um, videos I've put together to help educate you. That's where I started. Um, and um, this was uh, November last year, we launched our own version of Video, video SOA. So without making this too, too long-winded, Roxy, in short, instead of our SOA being what it had been in the past, which is this long 80-page jargon-laden document, detraction from the client experience, full of duplication, unnecessary content, and so on, you don't feel proud to give to a client. We've replaced that with our SOA is now a digital folder. So think like a Dropbox folder or a Google Drive folder, and that folder is called Statement of Advice, Andrew Rocks, right? And within that digital folder is a number of different documents that work together to satisfy the criteria of an SOA. So in terms of the, the things in that digital folder, we have a, uh, the video recording of the meeting, and we have a document called a Summary of Advice, which is like this super condensed version of what you would think a normal SOA looks like. So it's a PDF, but instead of 15,000 words, which is what we had, it's 3,000 words. There's no jargon. There's plenty of pictures. It just gives the client the valuable stuff, nothing more. Um, and that goes, that goes into that folder along with PDSs and slides from, from the meeting. And um, is this where your, your operations team really do a bit of the heavy lifting is that is that prepared in conjunction with the the advisor and the associate and and your your team abroad uh yeah so i mean there's a few people that that have involvement in putting putting that together so our power planning team puts the summary of advice document together the associates give them all of the inputs they need to put that document together um the associates will also put the modeling together and record a video of the modeling to show the client how on track they are for their intentions what their financial future is looking like at this point in time and they'll record a video that goes for about 10 minutes and they will send that video along with the summary of advice to the client a few days out from the meeting with the advisor to say, hey, you're meeting with you know, Stevie Jade or Ellie or Hannah or Lucy or whoever uh, on Friday, have a read of your summary of advice, watch this video to walk you through the modeling. So that will meet, what that means is when the client gets to the meeting, they're pretty well versed, but pun intended. Um, you said you'll do the chorus. I'll there do the you go. Thing. That's one all. Um, one all. Yeah, one all. Um, <laughs> and, it, uh, and, you know, and it means the meetings can be a lot shorter as well. So just but the, the, the last one to, 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 to touch on there is I think when people hear the term video SOA, a lot of advisors immediately think, oh, my God, that sounds crazy. That sounds risky. You know, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? Um, 
so much of really what happens already in the client advisor conversation is what's meant to go in a video SOA. Here's your cop. Here's your goals. Here's my recommendations. Here's the basis of my recommendations. Here's the concessional contribution you should make and how much. And the benefit is it's going to save you this much tax, move you towards your retirement goal, disadvantages are preservation age and not having access for a period of time, 15% contribution tax. Just by explaining that verbally, you've covered off like six of the eight SOA requirements. And if that conversation is just recorded, you, you, you're 70, 80% the way there. So you don't need to go and duplicate all of what you already tell the client in your meeting in a long-winded 80-page 80 page, 80 page document. So, um, and thank you for that. And, uh, and your passion, it's really, really evident, um, Corey, when it comes to that. And, and um, quite often you want to build something that you'd like to receive as, as a client. And, and it feels that way with, with that. Now, I'm going to talk about the people and the culture in your business. And um, uh, before, before today, you sent me through your culture uh, deck, verse culture deck. It is, um, it is an awesome, um, is an awesome document. It goes through lots and lots of different things. I've actually got open a page here, one of my favourites, which um, I'm sure you're going to regardless on, on on the structure. But a, a couple of things here that you mentioned is team first and team last. There's a few things here. Leave your ego at home. Be open minded to your teammates' ideas and perspectives. That's a uh, a real change from the the command and control kind of top down approach. And I love this one. If you need to shovel shit, get a shovel. Right. So with that particular highly professional and not lowbrow at all kind of um, entrance, how is it that, well, why do people join you? Why do people stay? Why do people grow with First Wealth? Yeah, well, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, firstly, just in terms of the team first, team last value, one of our five values here at First, the things you were just kind of reciting there are the guiding principles and behaviors. And every value has guiding principles and behaviors. And the idea behind that is, you know, I think in a lot of organizations, values are just kind of things that they're words that hang on a wall. They're ultimately largely meaningless. And um, I think that's in part because they're not committable. Like if, if your value is like innovation, like how does someone like do innovation every day? Like how do they keep that front and center and how they kind of show up and how they make choices during the day? So the guiding principles and behaviors are designed to make the values committable, but also aspirational as well. Because you know, that you don't live them perfectly. They are us at our best. Um, and those guiding principles and behaviors, as a team, we come up with it. So they're not all my words. The, you know, if you need to shovel shit, get a shovel. That was uh, Daniel Donovan, a head of operations, came up with that that guiding principle. And that really was born out of the fact that, you know, we've just been through COVID. We had some hard times. And sometimes you've just got to do the things you don't want to do for for, for the team. Dig, dig your heels in, grit a little bit, grind a little bit. And, um, you know, that was the language that he put forward and we agreed upon was a representation of kind of what, what that meant. You know, nothing's below you. So um, you're going to jump in there? Sorry, no, I was just going to say, look, um, I, I suppose to, to, to wind it back, what, what, when you, yet again, you started this business always dreaming that, or always anticipating that it was going to be an enterprise that had people, um, what does culture mean to you and how do you integrate it? Um, because as you pointed out, Slogans on a wall are just terrible. How does it play out in everyday life at, at first? Yeah. So in, t- in terms of culture, how do we how do we think about it? I mean, I think for so many people, culture feels wishy, wishy-washy. And you know, unfortunately for a lot of people, I don't think they've ever been part of a, of a great culture. There's not enough of them at this, at this point. Um, but for us, I mean, really what culture is, it's just what it's like to be at first. That's what the experience is here. It's, it's how teammates describe the culture to their family and friends like that's that's our culture and the the culture is defined in large part but not completely by the five verse values and it's underpinned by our purpose which is how people live the life they want and if that doesn't resonate with you not aligned to it then you're not going to fit in the culture so the values reflect they reflect who we are and 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 who we want to be and like i said the job's not to live them perfectly is to is to live them as best as you can well the floor is yours what are your five values yeah, so five values are total transparency, um, team first, team last, uh, client obsessed, make it simple and never settle. Okay. So um, the client one has been evident since we've started this this uh, podcast. Um, what was the one immediately after the, 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 the client? Make it simple. Is that right? Make it simple and never settle. Never. 
So from an operational perspective, making it simple has to start in, in making it simple for your own team members. How, do you, how does the company and, and, and yourself in your role, what things do you do that makes your advisors and associate lives uh, simple or more or easier on a daily basis? Yeah, a few things there. One is having a commitment to always refining and improving our processes and systems. So I think as you grow, you can't grow without chaos, without having really good systems and, and processes, and they've constantly got to evolve because the business will evolve. And when we think about processes and systems, we always think about simplicity. So always, we're always, as best as we can, and we don't do this perfectly, mind you, but always trying to look through the lens of, can we make this simpler? Can we make it shorter, easier? Can we make it more follow your notes? Um, and when we, when, we, when, we think it, when we think about pairing the systems with technology, because quite often you know, they go hand in hand, when we think about the, the tech stack as an example, we are always thinking about or making choices around what's going to be in the tech stack is what is going to give the simplest, easiest user experience for the clients and for the team. Not, 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 like, not what is the software that can do a million things. What is the software that does the two, three, four things that we're going to do all the time and does them so well that, that, a, that a five-year-old could follow their nose through it. So, yeah, the, I think it's the combination of that kind of thinking that, you know, helps us kind of keep things simpler. And how do you, how do you um, I suppose, get some perspective on how you're going? I mean, I, I ran a business in financial services for many years, and, and you mentioned that you're constantly open for innovation and whatnot. Who do you take advice from? Um, and do you have forums for your, for your team members to, to maybe bring up suggestions, or, or do you have external people come in and, and assist the way you look at it from a, a new lens? Yeah, a com- combination of those things, Roxy. So in terms of, first thing, in terms of team, um, we run a process called OKRs. Are you familiar with that? Uh, go for it. Tell us Tell o- us what... O- o- OKRs. So it stands for Objectives and Key Results. It's basically a really simple goal-setting framework that any organization can adopt. It was made famous by Google because they used it pretty much from day one. And now it's used by you know, companies everywhere, LinkedIn, Airbnb, you know, Netflix, et cetera. And the idea is basically you set goals as an organization um, and then you say, okay, well, if that's the goal, we need to know whether we're achieving it or whether we're on track to achieve it. So it's got to be measurable. So your goal is your objective. So an example for us is objective to provide a world-class client experience. So how do we know if we're doing that or on track to doing it? That's where our key result, KR, comes in. So then we go, okay, well, we're going to measure that through NPS, Net Promoter Score. For those that are familiar, that's that you know that common question of out of 10, how likely are you to refer a family member or friend to, to business X. And there's a formula to work out what your MPS score is based on your responses. So for us, the key result could be, okay, well, over the next three months or six months, we want to increase our NPS for our journey service, so ongoing clients, from 71 to 75, right? And then we work backwards from there to go, okay, well, if the goal is to move it from 71 to 75 in the next 90 days, what are the actions we think we need to take to improve the quality of the client experience to see the NPS rise to that level. So as a team, we'll sit down and say, hey team, the KR is to go from 71 to 75 for the NPS here. Let's all take some time to give thought to and come up with our ideas around how we improve the client experience. And then we bring those ideas together in a democratic way. We vote on, we, we share them. Um, we, uh, we vote on them and we do this visually as well because we include Philippines teammates where we need to. And then we, then that, we. That's really awesome, by the way. The, 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 the democratization. Then we, choose, then, we the then we choose the actions, and then we, and then over a ninety-day period, we try and do the actions, and we see what happens to the results. And the results tell you whether the actions are working or not. And if they're not working, you probably need new action. Cool. And um, do you have a? So you've given us the process of how you make those decisions from yep. an internal perspective. Is there a sort of a a monthly or or, or a quarterly rhythm as to? sort of when you take stock in your business? Yeah, there's a monthly, quarterly, and annual rhythm built around the, the OKRs. So we'll have annual objectives, and we will update the key results either quarterly or half-yearly. And we have monthly OKR days where we take time out of the business to share the OKR progress, um, what's happening, what isn't happening, what's working, what isn't working, get input and feedback from team, and then we will set about the actions for the next month or for the rest of 
the quarter. So that kind of that loops on itself every month, every quarter, and every year. And what I might do for people listening is we might include a link to the OKR sort of overall philosophy, and people can follow their nose and and figure that out. Because I'm a really big proponent of having structure, um, because structure does liberate you when you're running an organisation. Um, so this particular culture deck that you've you've done, when when did you start that? Um, is this a recent? Um, and and if I'm, I suppose the other one is, let's say for instance, um, I'm looking for, uh, to join your business. Um, how do you profile? Sort of who gets let in? Uh, yeah. Okay. So the the culture deck, um, we put that together about six months ago now, Roxy, and I initially got the idea. It was inspired by Netflix. I um, you know. People and culture is something that's always fascinated me and I've always felt like it's the foundation of a, a great team or a great business. And so I've always been curious and tried to educate myself around it. So Netflix is a culture that I really admire and uh, I came across now about 18 months ago their culture deck, which just gives anyone that doesn't work at Netflix this really great insight into what is life like at Netflix. Like how do they define their culture? What happens in there? What kind of people... You know, do they invite in on who survive, who don't survive in there, and so on. So I thought, what a great way to give people that might perhaps want to work at Verse an insight into what it's like here. So it was primarily built with the hiring process in mind because we've really begun to accelerate the amount of hiring we're, we're doing. We put this together, as I said, about six months ago, probably nine months ago, actually. And and by the way, it sounds like it's going well. You mentioned you've, you've taken on... Uh, three or four advisors, and and this is a really super tight talent um, market at the moment. So, um, yep. did, did did you interview many people um, to get to four or five advisors? Yeah, well, we've hired we've hired said four in the last um, since one July, and we've I counted the other day. I've actually interviewed thirty five financial advisors across Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane. So, um, you know, we are proudly really selective around who we let in and we have over time coming back to your, I think other question around the, the hiring process is you know we've kind of thought about the hiring process more so now kind of like the client experience let's 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 create you know one client experience let's create one hiring process that everyone goes through and it's constructed in a way to maximize the likelihood we get the right person on board so you know and, and I think that's the process we have now, which I'm about to kind of step you through. It's been born out of mistakes more than anything else. You know, hiring Oh, hard. tell me about your mistakes. Well, I have, I was re- this is the fun part. So, um, because quite often, uh, you know, the journeys, you, you, your life lessons and your learnings, what yep. mistakes in, in, in talent acquisition and retention have you made that really have, 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 have instructed you to, to move into this new phase? Yeah, I mean, or the simplest way to say the mistakes is not getting, not not hiring the right people. Um, I think that um, I think initially I would just, with this focused on culture, I didn't have enough focus on the role itself, and you know, were they equipped and do they have the capabilities and all the experience to actually excel in the role itself? More so, thinking simplistically about well, if 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 they're aligned to the culture, we'll figure the figure the rest out. So, wow. I think that, that probably meant we didn't have wow. the right ones on some of the seats along yep. the way. Um, you know, and, you know, there's... So, so just know, to stop, you, you you got culturally aligned people, but you you might have been off the mark on the role that they were going to do within your culture. Yeah, correct. Yeah, That's and right. just maybe, maybe they just didn't have the capabilities to do that role well. Yep. Maybe they weren't in the right role. Um, you know, and I think about like an advisor hire we made a couple of years ago now, you know, got the advisor on board and we didn't have the robust hiring process we have now. And the steps that if they had gone through that process now, they wouldn't have got through. We ultimately wouldn't have made the hire. But, you know, we had that advisor on board. We were having some clients that really weren't happy in a way we had to have in the past. And, you know, we had to let that advisor go, which is a really crummy experience for them. A crummy experience for us, you know, it's a hard part of business. Um, but, you know, we, we learned from that by making the process more robust. So I guess to run you through what the, what, what the hiring process is, like once we get introduced to a candidate, Often through a recruiter, but but not always. The first interview is is with myself. It's typically a coffee. It's a Zoom if they're in a state. It'll go for anywhere from like at least an hour, sometimes up to three if like we're hitting it off and we've 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 got the time. And I'm trying to get to know them personally, understand the story of their career. I will have sent them the verse culture deck beforehand. 
So they've right. got like 100, 126 lives they can consume around the culture, the values, the hiring principles, um, the operations, the tech stack, the license, the investment philosophy, client experience, all that stuff. So it, you know, it means that I don't get the same first 20 questions every time. And if they haven't read your culture decks, normally a pretty good indication of how, the, how you're not doing a long meeting with those candidates. No, no I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's happened. I mean, I've had a few times where people have read the culture deck and said, hey, um, thanks for that. I've had a read through. I don't think it's the right fit for me. I'm like, great. That's saved them the time. Yeah. yeah save them the time. Save me the time. So do the first interview. And if that goes really well, then what we will do is we'll have a cultural interview, which is a really important part of our business. We've done it from day one. So the cultural interview I'm never a part of. The candidate will meet with three verse teammates, typically in different roles, and they'll have a coffee with them for typically 75 minutes. And the whole idea of the cultural interview is the teammates at Verse here are trying to assess, is this person going to fit in our culture? Are they going to leave that value as well? Are they one of us? Like in their head, asking simple questions like, is my life going to be better if I spend 40 hours a week with this person? Because if the answer to that question is, I don't think so, or probably not, then then, then they're not going to be a fit. So at the, end of the, at the end of that cultural interview, the teammates will have a conversation amongst themselves. And the, and the question really is like, are they a cultural fit? And if anyone, anyone says no for any reason, and I mean any reason, we won't hire them. And it's our commitment to them. And it gives them this sense of ownership, which they should have over the culture because it's not mine, it's ours. And our job is to not just grow it and nurture it, but protect it as well. So we do the cultural interview and that's a chance for the candidate to, to ask the teammates anything. I'm not there. And, and, all, and I'll always say to the candidate, here's the cultural interview you're going to go into next. Ask them everything, right? W- what they love, what they don't love, what's been the most difficult time. Are they supported? Are they not? What would they change? What's the leadership like? What happens when they feel over, o- overwhelmed? Because you want to know these things so you can work out whether it's the right place for you. Do you feel like, um, I, I get this a bit from people, do you feel like that's that, that sometimes um, you, you want to hire people that are, are, are share the same kind of personality um, as, as the types of people that you're attracted to, but may not be fit for purpose for that particular role, it feels also like you've got a verse jury duty and that, and that you nervously sit outside and, and someone comes and gives you a piece of paper saying it's thumbs up or thumbs down. It must feel quite weird to have, you know, be rooting for this person. Oh, geez, I hope they get through only to be told that, sorry, no cigar. Well, it's, it's happened before. Um, I mean, I don't want to take up the team of my, t- the time of my teammates to go through that process if I am not very confident they're going to be ultra fit. But there's been a couple of occasions where I thought they probably would be, but someone or all of them have come out of there and said, I don't think they're a fit for, for this reason. So I'm like, okay, great. I'll call them up and I'll let them know we're not, we're not moving them forward. So, so that, that, that's the cultural interview. If, if, they get, if they get through that, Roxy, I'll keep this succinct. Then what we try and do is we try and get the rest of the hiring process booked on one day. So there's about another three important steps and it takes about five hours. So we book it, like we'll book, we'll book the day out with the majority of the day. So what we'll do is we'll get them to do high performance benchmarking. So hiring is both an art and a science. The culture stuff is more the art. The science is more around trying to identify, does the person have the capabilities to do this role incredibly well? So we use, it's another shout out here, we use people logic up for, for no, what people might call like a psych test. Yep. It's high performance benchmarking. So what, we, what we've what we done there is with people logic is we've had our teammates do the assessment and we'll take, say, you know, two, three advisors, in this case, the advisor role, that are proven high performers in the role. And we test their cognitive abilities and their behavioral traits. And then we take those scores of those two, three high performers and we blend them together to create our benchmarks. And then when a candidate for the advisor role does the assessment, they are getting benchmarked in terms of cognitive abilities and behavioral traits against what we know leads to high performance in that role at birth. Because like you know, you know, when you've got people that are fantastic at a role, when you're hiring, you're like, I just wish I could get another one of that or someone like that, right? So this kind of helps you know, kind of curate that. So we do the high performance benchmarking and then we'll talk them through the results. Um, we'll, we'll get them to, we'll print it out for them. We'll give them a highlighter and say, highlight everything you disagree with. And then we want you to tell us why you disagree. So you're testing self-awareness too. Once we've done the high performance benchmarking, we do a technical assessment. So 90 minutes, 
you know, broad scope advice, super, family trusts, investments, tax, et cetera. So we, we see what they know and what they don't know. And we don't need them to know everything because they might be coming from a firm where they have different advice, different scope in this gap. That's fine. We want to know what the gaps are so we can fill them really quickly with resources. And then we'll do a role, we'll do a role play. So like, we don't ever want to hire an advisor again and get into meetings with them and go, oh, Jesus, nowhere near where we thought it would be. So we do role plays. It's not real life. It's a little bit icky, um, but it helps us get a it helps us get a sense for how do you engage with your client? How do you navigate that advisory type conversation? How do you kind of hold the room with the client? How might they feel in your presence, kind of going through the process with you, even though your process now looks different, different to different to our process. So that all happens on the on the last day. Look, my observations there. The first thing was I, was I was thinking that you said the role plays are a bit icky, but probably I would lose the fake moustache and wig. Um, <laughs> it would it'd just be more natural. Um, but but seriously, there's this old adage of of, of hiring slow and firing fast. And um, if I'm listening to this and I'm thinking you you did this exercise with 35 people at some various way over the last six to 12 months and and I put my CFO's hat on, I'm thinking, you know, that's a lot of time, but it is dwarfed in the amount of heartache and pain that you have to go through when someone is in a role in your organization three to six months down the track and you know and everyone around you knows they're not going to, to make it. So congratulations on, on that 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 really quite quite in depth thing, and I would encourage people. Look, this is all about uh, the engine room. Is, is is why do people join? Why do they stay? And I think from what you've said, Corey, is uh, uh, they make the decision to stay at the same time they make the decision to join because you haven't left any rock, um, you know, un, un, unturned. Really, um, you're not going to find out surprises, and and that's probably going to assist you with with my next series of questions. Is once they're on board. Um, you know, how do you how do you manage top performance? Um, you know, I get a lot of feedback that, that 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 getting people to be top performers is half the battle. But when they when they become top performers, how do you manage them? Does does your business have um, uh, you know, obviously you probably do have KPIs. Do you have short term benefits? Do you have long term benefits? Uh, is is getting an ESOP or getting your team as part of your business in your future state? Sort of maybe take me through how you and and your operations team manage your people on an ongoing basis please yeah sure i mean like like you would understand that there's a lot to that like if you're trying to cultivate a high performance environment it's not just one thing it's like saying how do you have a great relationship with your spouse it's not one thing it's it, it's lots of things and it's a delicate kind of ecosystem as well i'm, so, I'm not sure i did yeah. a five-hour technical um <laughs> sort of sit down with 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 my my now wife uh, shout out i love you dearly <laughs> Please, please don't leave. <laughs> me, me either. I'm not sure either of us would have passed that, mate. Um, so, so, so in, ter- in terms of like high performance, because I think kind of like culture, like high performance is one of those things that can mean different things to different people, can sound a bit wishy-washy. I think there's a lot of businesses that talk about having a high performance culture, but it, it's probably more style than substance, I think. So like for us, like, you know, we've documented it in our culture deck. So people read this before they have a first interview, like, like, what does a high performance environment mean for us? And like, f- first and foremost, it, it's phenomenal teammates. You can't have a high performance environment if you don't have brilliant, brilliant people. That's the first thing we've defined. What it actually means to be a phenomenal teammate. It's about having great relationships and a real sense of connectedness within the team. So, like, we, we use the term team, teammates. We don't talk about staff, colleagues, bosses, and so on. Like, literally, the, we don't use the words. And the language to us really matters and you know you know we say to each other like we're not a group of people that work at the same company we're a real team and there's a real difference it's a nuanced difference but it's a really important difference so in helping people invest in those relationships and feeling connected together um it's high on autonomy and confidence so when you've got high performers that are aligned and there's a sense of purpose that you're kind of kind of share i know there's a lot of cliches here but when you when you got those things you can give people lots of autonomy. Um, you give them lots of trust. You give them lots of freedom. They can put ideas forward. Like it's it's what we would call transparent yet psychologically safe. They can say, I don't agree with this or I want to challenge this or I'm feeling this way or I'm feeling overwhelmed or Corey, I don't think you handle that meeting with you know with the team very, very well then and I'm not going to get my back up. I'm curious. Great. Uh, well, yeah, tell me more about it. What do you, what do you think I got wrong there? It, it, um, later on, I'm going to ask you whether you're, management style has changed but the actual when i when i read your 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 uh, culture deck 
um, it isn't just wishy-washy. You get into significant depth. You, um, nothing is by chance. You've, you've, you've mapped out your processes, your workflows. So in many respects, you've, you've set your team members up. Uh, you've created an environment where they can't, that, that, where they, they have the tools to succeed. And, and, and the next step is, uh, you know, the motivation. So you've got the old tools to succeed, which, you know, whether you call it a, a carrot or a stick, but how do you, how does verse then celebrate success? Yeah, so I mean, we have good question. We have different rituals in the in the business. Um, firstly, we every fortnight we have that gratitude session. We used to do it every week. We've done it every Friday for about six years, and we've recently moved it to fortnightly because as the team gets bigger, it takes longer to get through everyone's gratitude. Um, so we do the do them fortnightly, and basically, in short, mate, what happens is you share one thing you're grateful for. It could be a teammate, it could be something at work, it could be your spouse, it could be the the weather it could be you know a new app on your iphone whatever it's just gratitude and you share that with the team and what happens there is quite often there is a lot of gratitude being given to teammates for things that they have done often aligned to the values for things that have been achieved so it's kind of this you know fortnightly rhythm where we get to celebrate and acknowledge a lot of things we also have our monthly ceo update so everyone every teammate is in there they complete a short survey which is on type form beforehand and they get to share, like, I guess, what they think the wins have been, um, anyone they want to acknowledge in terms of living the verse values and why. And then, you know, I'm not reading everyone's answers out. Like, we're going around the virtual room on Zoom and pe- people are sharing, you know, here's this, is this win. Here, I want to acknowledge, you know, Stu or Lucy or, um, you know, Daniel for living this particular value. So those kind of wins get celebrated, I guess, organically. But then there's also stuff like, you know, I'm just, just thinking about this, you know, like in the office here, we try and we work hard, but we have a lot. We have a lot of fun, yeah. Because we, you know, I was going to say we love each other. Hey, to to a very large degree, we do. Um, I've got teammates I absolutely love, and I love being a teammate and proud of being a teammate. You know, we had Josh, who's been our associate for twelve months, just transitioning to the advisor role. Had his first what we'd call workshop a fortnight ago. Um, we could see that the client agreement got signed digitally. Um, during the course of the meeting, and um, when we noticed Josh was walking down the hallway to come back into the into the office, we call him Who Ah. You know, for those that are Aussie cricket fans, they would know Glenn McGrath and yep. the old Who Ah, Glenn McGrath, Who Ah, Glenn McGrath. We we sing Who Ah, Josh McGrath, Who Ah, Josh McGrath, when Josh does something great. So <laughs> Josh walks into the into the office. I'm sure feeling feeling great. Like this is a this is a milestone moment in his career. And we all just jumped out of our chairs and started chanting like we were off high school frat house. Ooh, ah, uh, Josh McGrath. Ooh, ah, uh, Josh McGrath. And it was just like, it was just this kind of 30, 40 seconds of just kind of pure fun and joy, something he'll remember. You know, and it's just, it's, it's finding little things and little ways to celebrate, you know, you know, all, all the wins along the way. Because there's so many good things that are, that are happening amongst all the challenges. And you've got, from what you've just said there, you've got some people that are working in the office, some people that are, that are working remotely in a, in a hybrid. Is that typically um, the expectation in your business? Yeah. So, I mean, we've done a lot of remote working in recent years. So we've got seven Philippines teammates. We're all at home through COVID, particularly because we're primarily in Melbourne team. And, um, you know, since we've come back from COVID, we've, we've, we've run uh, a balance of working from home and working from the office. So currently that balance looks like three days in, the office and two days at uh, two days at home, and we're just trying to strike the balance between giving people um, maximum autonomy so they can integrate their work into their life and not not the other way around. But also recognizing that as we're bringing people into the team, you know, getting them up to competence quickly and integrating them into the culture that happens when you're in happens when you're in person. Okay, you know? yeah. and these relationships have built they're built in her. So there's, you know, there's, there's, there's macro team and cultural things that we're trying to nurture and there's individual um, autonomy and lives we're trying to nurture as well. So that balance of three and two, I think, is something that's working for us at the moment at least. Well, thanks very much. And look, you mentioned um, uh, before, before the session that you, you're looking at, at, at um, implementing an employee share scheme. Um, what, what's what's your motivation? And 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 there's, they're probably your, your team are on are, are listening to this. So if this is news to them, um, I'm, I'm in trouble. But um, what was your motivation, and, and how are you looking to structure that? Yeah, so we've we'll, been used to a, a couple of them, um, but but most of them know that you know we've had the intention to launch a, an employee share scheme for some time. We won't call it employee share scheme because we don't use the word employee, and we call the verse share plan. Um, but I mean, like we've got got three motivations in in doing that. 
Um, number one is, and the most important is, we want to reward teammates. You know, I'm like I'm not building this business by myself, and we've got wonderful people that are working hard, that are committed. You know, and if we are organized well and we execute on our plans well and we maintain our sense of kind of purpose, we'll probably achieve a lot of really good things over time and build a really good business. And you you would know, you know, being entrepreneurial, like one of the consequences of of doing that is you build enterprise value. Um, that's got to go somewhere to some people at some point in time. And, you know, I I don't I'm not driven by it. And I don't get excited thinking about selling a business in whatever year's time and just getting the check. I want to share that with everyone else that's where we've got there together. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it adds an extra layer of alignment. We don't need the alignment per se, but it adds another layer of alignment, I think, in terms of just how people think more broadly about the business. Um, and number three is to attract talent. So like you know, like labor markets really tired. In financial advice in particular, we've gone from 26,000 advisors to 15,000 last couple of years. And, um, you know, I think for most firms, it's really hard to attract great people. I mean, we've got to do a lot of filtering, a lot of interviewing to to find those great, great people. And, um, you know, sometimes they're coming out of really well-established firms, you know, where they're making really good money. And um, I think particularly for, you know, great advisors, for a lot of them, they feel like the next natural step in their career once they've got a good client base and making good money is to have a stake, to have some equity, to have some skin in the gut, um, whether that comes with decision making, um, you know, powers or, or or not. So I think as a tool to help attract the best talent in advice, which you know we kind of don't shy away from, um, you know, we think it'll be supportive in doing that. That's our hope anyway. And and look, that's that's the, the premise for the engine room podcast is. Is is in many respects to give to give perspective to give talent um, who are out there a real window into what you're all about and 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 from the horse's mouth and 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 we want to get the best quality people gravitate to the best environments so that 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 as ensemble we can promote the positive evolution of financial advice and when uh, I suppose a couple of final questions there as far as the vision for the future and and I want to ask it in a few ways so. Um, you've got a business where you've got an operations or a general manager or a practice manager. You've got, you've got people uh, in in accountability streams, um, and financial planning has really come from a cottage industry. Um, so ironically, it was a cottage industry that also had the biggest banks in the world, um, sort of uh, involved in it. But where do you think the enterprise of most financial planning businesses is heading? The enterprise, I mean, I. Uh... I think that scale is becoming increasingly important. I know that sounds a bit like a cliche as well, but I think as the cost... Is that because of cost of delivery yeah, pressures? I think, I think more than anything else, Roxy, it is. Cost, the cost to deliver are, are high. It means the margins have a lot of downward pressure on them. And that means that to be able to do advice profitably, because in the long run for it to be sustainable, it's got to be profitable. Um, you've got to have, you know, you've got to have some economies of scale. And I think, you know, the idea of kind of the the small cottages or the, the one man or two man bands, it's getting harder and harder and harder. And I'm not the expert on the landscape to say that that can't exist, but I think that's getting more challenging rather than getting easy. And I think we're, we're seeing a lot of the one and two man bands kind of integrating with other, you know, larger, larger businesses and, and, and so on. So, it, um, you know, I think for, from our perspective, um, you know, we, we've had, like going back to the start of that chat, we've, we've always had the intention to, to build a, a, a real firm, to build a national firm, to, to, to build a brand, but we've never been motivated to do that just for the sake of it being big, like scale for the sake of scale. Like we, we genuinely want to give people access to great advice that we love giving to people that we know is making a difference to them and we want to do that for as many people as we possibly can. And the, as many people as we possibly can doesn't mean a one advisor business. It means lots of advisors in, in lots of places. So, you know, so much of, I guess, the decisions we've made along the way, and we've intentionally probably gone slower than we would have liked to, but it's been in part to try and just create some really good foundations. Not just around the culture, but the client experience, the operations, and the technology, so things are consistent and repeatable from a client experience point of view. So we're, I think now we're kind of getting to a point where things are really accelerating and you know, we can add advisors in Brisbane and Sydney and 
Perth or wherever, give them all the, the, the tools and the client experience, put the systems and the people around them, and it can work and it can work quite 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 quickly. So the intention is to continue to you know grow the grow the business out, not at the expense of, of, of great advice. And where we get to in the end, I'm I'm not sure, but I'm you know it's not going to. Um, I don't identify with it in the way perhaps I did when I first started. I, you know, cliche coming, but genuinely enjoying the journey, love who I'm working with, love what we're doing. And, um, you know, if, if all of us feel that way, we'll probably do good things over time. So the, when I think of a call to action, so are you saying it, that um, you, you've taken on uh, advisors recently, but you are in the market uh, for advisors, and in particular, um, you are going to spread your wings um, into different sort of states and, and, and areas. Um, and that's something that you're currently doing. So if anyone's listening um, and loved the sort of so far what we've been speaking about um, and in Brisbane or, or Sydney or other cities, you'd be open um, for, for a conversation? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're interviewing advisors every week and they're either at this point Melbourne, Sydney or Brisbane. We've, we hired uh, Ellie Fordham, who is a, a wonderful advisor, hired her in April last year. She's from Brisbane. Um, we just a couple of days ago had a Brisbane advisor come down here for a full day of interview. So we hope we'll be on our team next month. Um, we'd love to get some advisors on board in Sydney as well. So we're pretty agnostic around the location. And, and if anyone's listening to this podcast and thinking, hey, I, I resonate with some of this stuff, um, you know, I'd love to learn more. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn. You can check us out at our website, versewealth.com.au. You can um, you can even send through an inquiry via the US page, which is about um, about the team. I'm happy to shoot you the culture deck. They'll give you some of the insights we've been talking about, and if it makes sense for you and us, like we'd be more than happy to more than happy to chat. I love the enthusiasm, and, and look, the the purpose of of the Engine Room podcast is to give people an idea on uh, the management structure and their philosophy. Um, the, what you actually do for clients and if that's sort of what you're into, um, how the team works. And, and um, on our journey today, the, the, the most delight I got, um, which is a visual thing, is when I asked how you celebrate, you know, for, for those of you on our podcast, he, he nearly exploded with happiness. I couldn't control him. It's, you know, and, and, and I could just see him thinking of all the, the cool ways of what they've done at first. Well, look, thank you very much for your time and for your passion and for sending me through the culture deck. Um, and it sounds like not only have you generated a great practice and a great place to work at the moment, but you're now looking to take that logical step because, as you said, if you want to do this with as many clients and change their lives, you have to also change the lives of your own internal team. So thank you very much, Corey, and um, for being part of the Engine Room podcast. Cheers. Thank you, Roxy. I've really enjoyed it, and I appreciate the one, man. Cheers. Cheers.